I made a video response the other day to Heidler Day posting what is called, uh, what I called, Roy Batty's death speech uh, from the movie Blade Runner, and I was rather fascinated by the response that it uh, elicited. Um, some people actually got pretty mad that I, <laughs> that I interpreted Blade Runner this way. Now that fascinates me. I just want to make me want to, want to interest me, get really infuriated by something that I think is pretty non-controversial, uh, and that that'll put the hook in me. Um, now, the question arises, is Blade Runner a life-affirming movie? I said that yes, it is. And it's um, quite... It's life-affirming in quite a biased way. Um, now, Ridley Scott, being who he is, uh, is going to put some balance into things. Now, this video assumes knowledge of the movie, fairly extensive knowledge. I don't claim to be an authority on it, though. I, my Whatever knowledge I have only comes from merely watching the movie a million times and discussing it with other people. I haven't really researched it. I haven't gone into what Scott meant to make when he what meant to do when he made the movie. I haven't. I haven't even read the book. Um, so, <clears throat> it, just imagine that I'm just going by what I see on the screen when I'm watching, and that, of course, means that I can misinterpret it. But what I always say about perception is half of it comes from in here and half of it's outside. So, bear that in mind. And bear in mind that there's a lot of spoilers here, but uh, it's such an old movie that I don't think anyone's really going to mind. Um, well, first of all, uh, is the world that uh, Scott portrays, 2017 Los Angeles, i.e. next year, haha, is that really a worth, uh, world that's worth living in? And, you know, I think he makes it as miserable as possible, where in, you know, in the future Los Angeles it's cold and raining all the time. Uh, like, all the time. It's not sunny and warm the way <laughs> Los Angeles is now. It's also full of garbage and everything, even though it's um, allegedly deserted. The streets seem horribly congested and crowded. Um, and everything is falling apart and getting refitted, and everything's jerry-rigged, and, you know, it's just not, you know, not an appealing place to live. And not only that, the way that people live seems to be atomized. Uh, Deckard, the main character, Harrison Ford, spends his off time drinking alone in his apartment <laughs> in this gigantic, ludicrously huge uh, apartment building that's miles high, and he's just lost in this urban jungle. He doesn't seem terribly interested in his own life. He's just tired of killing people, because uh, he's a Blade Runner. He's one of these people that hunts down and kills uh, refractory uh, replicants. So, okay, um, the movie deals with the creation of artificial intelligence or artificial life or cloning or whatever you want to call it, and it deals with... Um, three main people involved in that, involved in the production of human beings. First one is Eldon Tyrell, who wants to create something along the lines of a Superman. Um, not a Nietzschean Superman, he almost wants to create a Nazi-type Superman, um, whereby, you know, what they what they are is, you know, as his, the motto of his company, the Tyrell Corporation, is more human than human. I would go so far as to say that he wants to create better than human, not more human than human although he does sort of exaggerate certain human characteristics. And um, what you get is you get sort of human beings more or less, quote-unquote, on steroids. And it's a good thing to put in there, that, that as though they're on drugs, because they've been deliberately engineered so that they die after four years of life. He says, well, you know, the light that uh, shines twice as bright uh, only lasts half as long. And that's the first person. That's the first sort of parent figure. Um, then there's a fellow by the name of Hannibal Chu, a minor character in the novel, but an interesting one, who is just involved in the production of eyes for replicants or any other sentient beings. Um, that's his, uh, his forte. He engineers genetically human or animal eyes. And he just says, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just doing eyes. I... Uh, you know, it's just a job to me, etc., etc. In other words, he's not even paying attention to what he's doing um, in creating life. He's just blindly doing it. He's punching a clock and going through the motions and doing that because that's how he pays his bills. Sort of irresponsible, or not even irresponsible, but unthinking parenting. And then... A lot of people have said that uh, J.F. Sebastian is kind of a likable character. I think that Scott is implying that he's perhaps the most horrible character in the movie, if we're going to say that there are horrible characters in the movie. Um, because he has created sentient beings to be essentially toys. 
Um, he's a shy and retiring sort of fellow, a nice guy. When you meet him, you think he's nice enough. And um, he's got some connection to um, Eldon Tyrell, maybe his lover, it's unclear. Uh, but he's created these little toys that greet him and talk to him when he's in the house. And these are apparently, in his house, these are apparently sentient beings, but they're somehow hampered. They're, they're engineered to be toys. But you get indications that they understand their predicament. They understand that there's something, I don't know, artificial about them. They're almost... Scott doesn't present them as abominations, but he presents them as things that, you know, people... Uh, that, that As though J.F. Sebastian is playing God in a completely careless way. Um, when... And, and, and again, being Ridley Scott, he gives you just tiny little clues. The clue that, that, that got me thinking that these two or three creatures that uh, J.F. Sebastian had in his apartment were kind of deliberately portrayed as abominations were just a scene where you see the face of one of these little beings. It's got a long nose and it's wearing a Nazi World War II helmet and it's just sort of looking around with very alert, very human-looking, very conscious and sentient-looking eyes. It doesn't understand what it is. It's freaked out by its own existence. <clears throat> um, the other one's a teddy bear. You don't really see much, and you know. Uh, but it, it's implied, though. I think that these things—that's not why you create life. You don't create life just to be fun. Um, so you know, you've you've done it. You know, it's assumed that J.F. Sebastian has done it in a wholly egoistic manner, and all he gives a damn about is not being alone in his apartment. And it is a deserted city and miserable, and everyone lives, as I say, an atomistic life. <clears throat> um, so th there's your three people, three parent figures in the movie. Um, Tyrell goes into elaborate detail, almost relishing what he's done. You, you almost see like he's getting a ego kick out of it all um, where he says I want to build better human beings and even to, con to control them I'll even implant memories in their minds uh, make, complete, make completely artificial things <clears throat> that don't even know what they are uh, Leon's famous line is how old am I <laughs> um, you know they don't even they, they don't quite understand where they're coming from they can't trust their own memories there's the fascinating scene where Deckard actually shows uh, Rachel that her own memories are bogus, are implants from somebody else's mind, and the effect that this has on her. But again, it doesn't just end there. He goes ahead uh, rather later on in the movie when she's playing piano and she's saying, I, I remember lessons, but I can't trust any of it. And Deckard sort of goes, you play beautifully. In other words, humans have always lived with the fact that we don't ultimately know what we are, where we're from. Um we can perhaps examine ourselves and ascertain our nature. We don't know what life is. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't know where life began or, con or when consciousness begins or where it ends or anything like this. We don't know what time, space, any of that stuff is. We live with a gazillion unknowns all of our lives, and we seem to be okay with it. Um, so, you know, that to me, that was one of the most telling scenes of the entire movie. Somebody who knows that they're a replicant, who knows that they're living in a state of complete artificial reality not in terms of the external reality but the interior reality they believe that they're or they believed that they were something that they weren't Rachel thought that she was just a regular young woman when in fact she was just a recently produced replicant with artificial memories in there <laughs> so <clears throat> that would be quite a terrifying moment for anyone or anything wouldn't it but uh, ironically the person who was uh, out to kill people who had to, had to kill replicants, Deckard says, you play beautifully, never mind. And he falls in love with, with Rachel, of course. And that's the, you know, the ultimate irony of the movie, is the guy who's supposed to kill replicants, it's implied he may even be one himself, but he, um, he falls in love with one. And he says, I don't give a damn what you are. I, I, I don't care. It doesn't really matter where you came from or anything. What I see is what's right in front of me here. Um, and that's what matters to me. Um, your past doesn't matter. Your future doesn't matter. It's only here and now. Um, you know, and, and the movie kind of ends on that note. Now, the in, the interesting thing is, of course, um, the the exception to the, uh, the the bit where I get the idea of um, life affirmation is in the lives of the replicants. Um, 
there's four replicants. Um, there's Roy Batty, who's the soldier, built for the wrong reason, of course, built to fight and kill. Um, there's uh, Zora, built for the wrong reasons. She's an assassin. Um, gorgeous, of course. And then there's Pris, built for the wrong reasons. She's a prostitute. <laughs> uh, just not nice reasons to create human beings, but they're deliberately created to do the jobs that humans don't want to do. Uh, and it never really says why Leon is created, but he's sort of, I don't know, a bit of a half-wit compared to the other uh, replicants. He's not as intelligent as the other three, or he, d he isn't portrayed that way. Um, but again, he has um, he has feelings, just like anyone else. Uh, and uh, again, that's the main thing of the movie. He, you know, it's, um, He's afraid to die, or he doesn't want to die, or he's afraid, he's tired of being in fear, you know, where it's... Uh, painful living in fear, isn't it? He says, in other words, there's somebody hunting you, trying to kill you. How do you like it? Um, now, the four replicants. There's nothing in them that says that they think that their existence is horrible. Pris, the prostitute, says, um, I think, therefore I am. Now, the movie's peppered with these illusions, and, um, it kind of fascinates me that, that, that all of this stuff was dragged into the movie, was brought into it to sort of show both sides of the coin. But first and foremost, those replicants wanted to live. Now, again, that begs the question, why did they want to live? Well, I narrow it down to Roy Batty, essentially. He's the main replicant, and he's the one who gives the most accurate uh, depiction of what it means to be a replicant. And um, the last uh, final sequence is what really shows you what he really is. He's a superman. He can drive his fist through solid marble walls, or concrete and marble walls. He can, you know, move incredibly fast, you know, leap tall buildings in a single bound type thing. Um, and he seems to be utterly relentless, and he's, you know, even cruel, playing with Deckard like a fish on a hook. Um, but in the end, we know what happens. He explains why he wants to live. He explains why life to him is something that he wants to continue. He just loves the wondrous experience of existence. He likes, you know, he talks about the things that he has seen in his life. These wonderful um, experiences, wonderful moments, he calls them. And it explains his actions throughout the entire movie. Um, he's loyal to the other replicants. Um, he uh, he wants to continue to exist as he has existed, even though he was nothing but a slave his entire life, a soldier slave. Um, he still thinks that that is something that he w that he would have preferred to have continued. It's better than non-existence. Um, and he also sort of very emphatically talks in favor of life throughout the entire movie. You know the famous line, I want more life, fucker. Um, Valhalla has left some pretty acid comments on my uh, on my previous video, and I was kind of interested by that. It really That fascinated me, because he doesn't normally talk like that, so maybe he's got some sort of strong views on Blade Runner, I don't know. But um, he kills his father. Uh, Valhalla says that he kills his parent, i.e. Batty kills uh, Eldon Tyrell because he created him. And I said, no, 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 that's not why he created him. Uh, not why he killed him. He killed him because he couldn't extend his life and he was frustrated. He killed him because he gave him only a four-year lifespan, which isn't enough. Uh, the implication is, of course, that a human lifespan, i.e., you know, 60 to 100 years, would have suited him a lot better and not to die at the peak of his prowess uh, and die pointlessly, just sort of you know, the way that people sort of, quote-unquote, die when they're in the Matrix and you yank the plug out of them. <laughs> they just end. Um, and it's interesting that he wants all of this life. And he, you know, um, Deckard says in those final moments he loved life more than anything else, not just my life, anybody's life, you know, that sort of thing. That, that was sort of um, Deckard's epitaph for Roy Batty. But um, also the way he dies. He just sort of says, oh, this was... I wish this could have continued. And it's obvious that he's not trying to stay alive because he's afraid, because he dies with a smile on his face. Or not, I wouldn't say a smile on his face. He just sort of 
bows down and dies in a very solemn, very profound moment. But not in a state of fear, just in a state of disappointment. He wanted this to continue. Um, and he wants something of him to go on afterwards, i.e. Deckard's life. The man who tried to kill him throughout the entire movie. That turned him into a hunted slave. He says, do you know what it's like to live with an assassin chasing you around your entire life? Not knowing where, you know, if you step around the next corner, somebody's going to blow your head off. Do you know what that feels like? He just wants Decker to know what it's like. And then he saves his life. <laughs> I've taught you what you need to know. Now, go out and live, for God's sake. You know, go out and actually don't sit there in your damned apartment drinking yourself into a stupor with horrible Chinese rice spirit. How about you uh, get out and live? You know, here I here I am a Superman. I want to continue living, and uh, and I can't. And here's you who are faced with uh, two choices in your life. You can have a love affair with a gorgeous replicant, and perhaps uh, marry her or whatever. You are obviously in love with her, Rachel. Uh, but you sit alone in your apartment drinking. You know, what kind of a life is that? What are you doing to yourself? Live, damn you! I would if I was in your position. I'm a replicant. Look at me. I'm about to die. What, did I, what the hell is the matter with you? Get off your ass and live! That was Roy Batty's final message to Deckard. Now, of course, Deckard was moving towards forming a relationship with uh, Rachel anyway. So, um... It's not as if he it's not as if Roy Batty had to say this just to get Decker to do it. It was probably going to happen anyway. But that was his final message to uh to Decker. Roy Batty's final message. Live you know, sort of like Shawshank Redemption. Get busy living or get busy dying. Uh this is a movie that I'm absolutely fascinated by. It's I, I told uh Phoenix Sh uh, Chastain that I've watched it at least a hundred times. Um you know, I, I may actually just watch it soon enough uh, again um, if you know if the, circ if the circumstances are right I usually like to watch it start to finish and not be interrupted or whatever um, but it's a profoundly visual movie and it really really fascinates me to this day I think it's it's one of the most uh, profound movies ever made uh, and the points that it raises are incredible and I think that there's a reason why one might have to watch it at least 10 or 15 times to even wrap your head around the whole thing is the visual effects and it's one of those movies where you suspect that the producers wanted every last scene to be exactly the way it turned out now there's a couple of errors that people can point out in it and there's a couple of um, I don't know obviously phony shots there but um, be that as it may just every last little detail they've taken so much care with it that it's almost as if they this is somebody's magnum opus that they really want this to turn out exactly the way that it showed up on the on the screen that's what makes it so fascinating and and the visual imagery comes at you so fast and in, in such a disorienting um, proliferation of images that it's almost difficult to follow the plot not because the plot is terribly complex it is a little complex but it's because there's too much to take in. <laughs> there's so much going on, which is why I guess it's taken on the the dimensions of something of a cult film, or I wouldn't just say something. I think it might have been might, might be one of the top ten cult films of all time, um, because you can watch it so many times. And you know, and again, I, I consider myself lucky that I've never really engaged in a huge critique of the movie, and now I'm doing something like that at the age of 51. Um, because I just wanted to see it and make form my own Blade Runner in my own head. I think we all do this, but I never really wanted to take it apart from the point of view of the movie critics or you know people on the inside. I just look at it for what it is and say, what does this movie say to me? There are obviously dissenting voices. <laughs> there are obviously differing opinions here. But I stick to my point. Um, it's not just life-affirming. It's a, it's a movie that says life in and of itself is a treasure. Uh, existence in and of itself is good. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I would say that existence can be, but you have to make it worth living. Shawshank, get busy living or get busy dying type thing. Um, I, although I suppose there's elements of that in the movie as well. But um, as I say, it's fascinating the the um, I don't know 
anger it seems to have provoked in some people. Um, beware, be warned, this movie obsesses me. I could talk about it for years, probably. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry if this movie sort of was rambling and sort of went all over the place. Uh, I'm just talking to an audience that I assume is thoroughly familiar with the movie. 